Thank you for joining us today as we discuss successful deployment for an Azure Defender for IoT. The agenda for this course will cover deployment, prerequisites and site preparations, onboarding, and sanity and fine tuning. The reference documentation is available at the site shown below. Multiple deployment options exist for Azure Defender for IoT. An on-premise option would involve sensors connected to the OT equipment, potentially aggregating events to an on-premises manager or to an on-premises security information events monitor, such as Splunk or other. A hybrid installation would involve on-premises sensors, again connected to OT equipment, potentially aggregating to an on-premises manager, and then providing event data externally to a cloud-based seam, such as Azure Sentinel. A third option would be cloud-based, and this would involve on-prem sensors, again connected to the OT equipment, but feeding data directly through Azure Security Center to Azure Sentinel. To understand how Azure Defender works, it involves a physical or virtual appliance. That appliance would plug into a network uh, connection, either a, a span port or a network tap. The appliance has up to nine ports and can connect to multiple switches. This device itself is a smart sensor it's fully passive and, and totally non-intrusive on the network. It listens to traffic only. It has the capability to uh, work in an offline mode in a situation where it's not possible to connect directly to the network. PCAPs could be collected and fed through the appliance to uh, gain information about the network and any threats. It can be connected to an on-premises management web console or managed via Azure Security Center through an external uh, connection. And it involves native security information events management integration, so it can pass alerts up to those products. Azure Defender uh, would normally be connected on either the supervisory process control or cell area uh, networks and the connection method to a network switch would normally be to come from a span port on that network switch that uh, network switch that's handling OT traffic and go directly to the sensor as we discussed it can connect to multiple uh, switches as shown in this diagram There are five overall steps in the deployment process. Gathering site information involves getting information on managed switches, the VLANs that, that are configured on those switches, a rough asset count, and a diagram of the network architecture. In step two, this information is reviewed and the owner would subscribe to the service via the Azure, Azure portal. The next step involves site preparation and configuration. Uh, what happens here is to configure span ports, uh, decide on an IP address for the sensor or sensors, uh, configure needed firewall rules, and order the, the hardware. Step four is pre-deployment validation. That's where we collect a PCAP using Wireshark or a similar tool and look at the data from that PCAP and verify that the, the correct and expected information is being uh, captured from the switch span port. Step five is onboarding uh, sanity and fine tuning and then production. We've developed a nine step deployment process as evidenced by this table. The first step is to identify the solution infrastructure. We want to look at what the network architecture is, what type of equipment is involved. This is normally done uh, in combination between the project manager and the OT engineer. And it's done uh, on, a, on a per site basis because each site is different. 
Step two involves re uh, registering for Azure Defender for IoT. The owner would do this as a subscription contributor, and it's based on the number of committed devices in groups of a thousand. The third step is site preparation, and this involves ordering the hardware, configuring a span port, cabling, uh, firewall rules, assigning static IPs, and validating uh, using PCAPs that are collected. This is normally done by the OT engineer. Again, it's done on a per site basis. Step four involves installing and setting up the on-premises management console. Depending on whether it lives in the IT uh, realm or whether it's an on-site, it would uh, decide whether it was the IT or the OT engineer to set it up, and that can be done at any point. Step five is onboarding the sensor to Azure portal. Uh, this is again is done by the subscription contributor and it's on a per sensor basis. Deployment uh, involves physically installing and setting up the sensor. It usually involves either an IT or an OT engineer and it's done on a per site basis. There could be one or more sensors. Step seven involves connecting the sensors to the on-prem management console. Again, the same people would be involved and it's on a per sensor basis. Finally, uh, configuration, fine tuning and optimization would be done by the same folks. It normally would be done on a per site basis, uh, whether it's one or multiple sensors and then hand off to operations. Expanding on item one in the previous table, we've identified some discovery questions that are important to achieving an effective installation. The first of these is to determine a network diagram for the OT system or systems that we intend to monitor. These diagrams are often not up to date, but they do provide some indication of the, the switches and, and where they are located in the control system and give us the ability to identify the right locations to install sensors. We need an estimated number of assets in the network. Again, this is for a licensing issue. Uh, subnets and VLANs should be identified. This helps us to, to evaluate what's seen once the sensor is hooked up. The switch model numbers will identify whether the switches are capable of span ports or whether taps need to be used. And a list of vendors and OT protocols, again, identifies once the information is looked at after the installation, whether we're seeing the right traffic or what, what's expected to be seen. There are some guiding physical and network questions that need to be asked. The first one is if we connect to this switch, will we see communication between the HMI and the PLCs? Well, if we're interested in this network, the PLCs exist here, the HMI may be here. So the switch that we want to look at is this one. If we're interested in traffic that's going between segments or between subnets, we may want to be looking at these switches. Another question is what's the physical distance between the switches? The switch here and the switch here may be in different buildings. If, there's a, if that's the case, there may be the need to do R span or provide some kind of uh, use some additional cable or fiber that may be available. Another question has to do with the physical media. Is it fiber or copper? And if it's fiber, is it single mode or multi mode? And what are the types of connectors that are used? This will avoid. Uh, delays when, when the installation is occurring. If the switch is unmanaged, is there a place where we can install a tap to see the majority of the traffic? Uh, or is it possible to replace the switch with a managed switch? Another question that's uh, rather obvious is, is there physical rack space for an industrial defender for IoT collector, which is typically a one u server that uh, would fit in a server cabinet? Finally, who manages the switches? Is it an external entity like a, a vendor or an OEM, or is it the IT or, or the OT engineer? This information needs to be coordinated with the operational engineers so that they're completely involved 
and are understanding uh, that this system will not affect their operating plan. Step two involves registering with Azure Defender for IoT. This can be done by going to the Azure Defender for IoT portal at this location, uh, select Azure Defender for IoT, and then select Onboard Subscription. You'll see a screen that looks like this down here. And uh, the next step after you do this will be the uh, pricing page where you identify the number of assets that are involved and then download an activation file. This screen is intended to show that in order to onboard a sensor, one of these three permission levels in Azure portal is necessary, either security administrator, subscription contributor, or subscription owner. Preparations and configurations item three involves four major tasks. The first is the hardware order. Hardware can be purchased as a pre-configured system or as an ISO file to, to download and install on your own hardware. The next task involves making the net network changes necessary to mirror traffic out to the sensor. This could be a span port configuration on a switch or switches or a tap installation and configuration. Static IPs need to be set up for each sensor. That's the uh, third task. The static IP, uh, a gateway address, DNS, and a subnet mask for each sensor will be needed for installation. Finally, firewall rules need to be set up to allow the sensor and the on-prem manager to be able to communicate. In order for this to occur, uh, an SSL connection on port 443 is necessary. Also for troubleshooting, it's recommended that uh, SSH port 22 is allowed open so that uh, shell access uh, can be uh, allowed to the sensor if there are any issues. The on-prem manager uses NTP to control time for attached sensors and this would be uh, UDP on port 123. These are necessary. Uh, beyond that, if uh, Alerts are sent out over email, SMTP 25 needs to be open. Uh, if DNS is used, port 53 needs to be open. Uh, whatever centralized logging system is used, if it's uh, a uh, syslog type system, it might be 514. Other log systems may have their own port numbers, but this needs to be uh, set up and it's based on whatever the defined port is for that security information events monitor. Um, in order to uh, connect to uh, Active Directory, uh, the associated LDAP port needs to be open, for example, TCP 389. Uh, if it's desirable to monitor the sensor over SNMP, then port UDP 161 needs to be open. There's a special case where the sensor can do Windows endpoint monitoring. Uh, in that case, uh, what's required is UDP port 135 and all TCP ports above 1024. This is the only situation where the sensor would be actively polling the network. And that's not uh, normally um, a part of, of the installation, but it is possible. For cloud connected, uh, this uh, URL needs to be allowed through your firewall. The next step would be to, to get a PCAP uh, file from the span port or, or TAP that's been set up on the network. Um, the reason for this is, is threefold. We want to validate that the switch configuration is done correctly. We want to see if we're seeing the appropriate protocols that uh, your um, system is supposed to have. Uh, 
and we want to also verify that the bandwidth is within the capability of the sensor that we're, we're planning to install. Uh, this PCAP normally would not need to be very long, just a few minutes. And these are the things that we would look for in the PCAP. Obviously, the first thing is we want to see unicast traffic. Uh, unicast traffic is, is traffic that goes from a specific source to a specific destination. Uh, if all we're seeing is, is multicast or broadcast traffic, uh, then likely the, the span port is not set up correctly. Uh, <clears throat> or we're on the wrong port. Um, when we look at statistics, protocol hierarchy, and, and uh, Wireshark, if uh, it will identify the different protocols that are seen. In this case, we're seeing Profinet, uh, we're seeing Siemens S7, and we're seeing some Modbus over TCP. If those are the things that we intended to see, uh, then we're in the right place on the network. If if we're not seeing the protocols we expect to see, then we might evaluate whether we're connected correctly. And the last thing would be uh, statistics endpoints. And this would give a list of all the, the devices that are communicating on this network. Uh, so that should give the user a, a, an estimated number of devices to, to verify uh, and to substantiate his original estimate. The next step here is to install and set up the on-premises management console. Uh, and basically, this involves uh, downloading the ISO from the website. Uh, in, in, in this case, uh, you just basically select that you want an on-prem management. Uh, you select the version and click Download. Uh, refer to Defender for IoT installation documentation, install it, and activate it. And, uh, and it's up and running. This can be done on a, on a virtual installation or on a physical installation. Step five is to onboard a sensor to Azure Portal. The sensor may be either cloud connected or locally managed. If the sensor is locally managed, the next screen that's presented will request a sensor name and an associated subscription. At this point, the user will be able to download a sensor activation file. If the sensor is cloud connected, uh, it will also be necessary to identify an IoT hub and a zone before downloading the activation file. Step six, to install the sensor on your own hardware, go to the Azure Defender for IoT site select getting get started and then under get started select set up a sensor you'll be presented with this next screen in this screen there's two choices one would be to order a pre-configured sensor uh, or the other would be to select a version and download an ISO file once you download the ISO file refer to the instructions uh, linked here in the uh, presentation and follow the instructions to install the sensor on your hardware. Again, if you prefer not to uh, install yourself and purchase a pre-configured sensor, it can be done through the website here or by emailing hardware.sales at arrow.com. They're the authorized seller of Azure Defender for IoT pre-configured appliances. Once a sensor is installed and powered up, three pieces of information are required to log in and get it functional. The first, obviously, are sign-in credentials, username and password. The second is the activation file associated with the sensor. This was downloaded during the onboarding process discussed in step two. The third is an SSL TLS certificate. These will be discussed in more detail in following slides. To access a physical sensor, the management port, as shown here, needs to be connected to your network. Uh, 
on the same network browse to this allocated static IP for the sensor appliance and then sign in with the dialog box as shown. At the login screen, you're going to enter your, the credentials that you got either from the ISO install or from the uh, password recovery option. Uh, <clears throat> the next step uh, would be a dialog box that asks you for the activation file. At this point, uh, you would uh, upload or connect to that activation file that you previously downloaded. and uh, agree to the terms and conditions uh, on this form and then select activate. Uh, <clears throat> at this point you're going to be requested for a certificate. Uh, the, the machine uh, by default will use a self-signed certificate. Uh, Microsoft does not recommend that for a production environment, so uh, you're going to be encouraged to use a, uh, uh, a certificate authority. Uh, if you do not have one, then, then the system will use a self-signed certificate and proceed. Now, in terms of troubleshooting, if you can't connect to the web interface, uh, the first thing to look at is to make sure that the sensor or your machine is on the same network as the sensor. Uh, it's going to either be on the same network or if it goes through uh, a router or a firewall, uh, you need to make sure that those are properly set up. Um, you need to obviously make sure that the uh, Ethernet connection is connected to the right port on the, on the sensor, and then to try to ping the sensor. If you can't ping the sensor and you can't resolve that with uh, firewall rules or routing, then the option is to go to the device itself, hook up a monitor and a keyboard to the sensor, um, and at that point, uh, type uh, login and type network list. That will uh, provide this screen, which will identify what the, uh, the IP address of the machine is and the default gateway and so forth. If those are incorrect, you can use the network edit settings command to, uh, and then follow the, the uh, steps down here to reconfigure the network address, uh, subnet, DNS, default gateway, etc. Uh, when you're done and you select yes, uh, the sensor will reboot, and when it reboots, it'll come up at the right address then you would want to try to ping the sensor again and see if you can uh, gain access to it. Connecting sensors to an on-premises management is the next uh, option. And basically, the on-prem uh, management console aggregates information from the sensors. It can perform sensor backups. Um, it can also manage alerts uh, from multiple sensors, uh, investigate sensor disconnections, and it's able to um, download updates to the sensors and also threat intel updates from a single pane. So that's, um, that's a good option. Uh, <clears throat> we recommend that you group multiple sensors monitoring the same networks in one zone. The reason for this is that uh, the the on-prem manager will coalesce that information collected from multiple sensors so that you won't be showing uh, more devices than you actually have in your network because you're seeing them in, in more than one place. Uh, <clears throat> the sensor setup involves uh, copying a connection string from the central manager, uh, pasting that connection string into a dialog box on the sensor that um, is your management uh, console connection dialog box and then click connect here uh, and when you do that uh, you should get this connection message. Once the sensor is up and running we'll do some quick sanity checks. The first thing is to make sure that we're getting traffic in this case 2600 packets per second. 
Uh, we don't want to see zero in this field. That's an indication that uh, either we're not connected or the switch is uh, not correctly set up. <clears throat> we'll also look in the device map and we would expect to see the number of devices increasing over a period of time, uh, approaching the number that was projected based on uh, our previous knowledge of this installation. To see. Uh, a third sanity check we can do is to open the investigation wizard uh, and create uh, a dashboard where we add a total bandwidth uh, and a traffic by port. And as we look at this, we'll see what the bandwidth is going through the, the sensor, and we can look at the protocols that are in use. In this case, if we're uh, expecting to see delta V traffic and we're seeing that, uh, then that would indicate that we're probably connected in the right place. After the sensor is run for a little while, it's uh, a good idea to look at uh, notifications. These would identify uh, changes that the system has detected, and uh, each of these can be looked at to determine if, if they look like they're correct. Uh, the notifications can be accepted or dismissed. Uh, additionally, uh, important devices can be identified on the asset map by selecting uh, the device, right-clicking, and marking as important. In the uh, vulnerability assessment reports, these devices are evaluated more critically since they're considered more important. By default, the sensor will automatically uh, detect subnets where there's traffic. It will generate a list of subnets that are available under system settings, subnets. Uh, the user can go in and add names to subnets that will help in terms of uh, providing meaningful information on the asset map as well as in the uh, uh, investigation wizards. Um, you can also define uh, whether the assets are ICS subnets or whether they're segregated or not. Uh, this can also be turned off, and um, these settings are available for the user. It's a good idea to tune these so that you're looking at the uh, devices that are important to your installation. A newly installed sensor will wake up in learning mode. In learning mode, the sensor is monitoring traffic and comparing it against the existing rule sets uh, within the sensor and will generate some alerts. These alerts should be investigated by the startup team. In some networks, some of the uh, messages that would indicate an alert may be normal for that particular network. In that case, it's possible to learn the alert. Uh, if the alert is uh, something that's understood but not normal, it can also be acknowledged or it's possible to download PCAP files and study the, the traffic for, associated with that alert to identify what the actual situation is. It's possible to import firewall rules uh, from any of these three vendors, Juniper, Fortinet, and Checkpoint. Those firewall rules are used in the vulnerability assessment report, which evaluates the rules and identifies any weaknesses. Um, in terms of troubleshooting, uh, one use case would be that you have an asset that's not discovered uh, or the asset count is not what you would expect. Uh, this could be, come from a variety of reasons. One is that you're not in the right place on the network. You're not monitoring relative, relevant traffic or the span port is not properly set up. Uh, another possibility is that there's uh, non-private addresses used in an internal network. In this case, they're going to appear in the internet cloud because we see those as public addresses. So those subnets would need to be defined within your subnet list. And you'd have to manually define those as being internal and, and OT subnets. Um, <clears throat> another case use case would be asset type unknown. Uh, this could be, again, that you're not monitoring the rele relevant traffic. Uh, 
uh, or it could be that the asset's not communicating. In, in the case of a switch, for instance, if it's not communicating over link local discovery protocol, we're, we may not know it's a switch. Uh, so we might miss, uh, inappropriately identify it. Uh, it could be a span port misconfiguration, or it could be that that protocol is not necessarily completely supported. Um, use case three, if something is, is misidentified, uh, that could be a function of, of um, having not seen the traffic that would identify that device yet. A prime example of that would be a PLC. Uh, when a PLC is programmed, uh, within the string of traffic that goes to the PLC usually is the PLC name, the, the, the model number, uh, the version, and, and a bunch of other traffic. Um, so when, when the PLC is loaded, we would see that traffic on the wire. But if the PLC is not loaded during the period of time that, that this uh, system is monitoring it, we we'll never see that traffic and we would not know what that device is because, because we're only monitoring, we're not probing the, the device. In the enterprise view of the on-premises manager, we can create sites, business units, and regions. And then in the site management, uh, we can define zones and assign sensors to those zones. Uh, this allows us to uh, organize the information based on, on business units, regions, uh, and sites for the purposes of reporting and also for um, uh, access. And this gives you a, a sort of a broader view. For instance, if we were uh, interested primarily in, in the glass business unit, we would be looking at uh, these two streams uh, coming from these factories. And that would involve uh, this zone and this zone and potentially this zone. Um, so uh, also, if we were just looking at Western Europe, we'd see these two factories and we could um, set this up uh, to identify the different business units and, and allow for granular selection of information and reports, as well as alerts. The on-premise manager allows you to define exclusion rules. Uh, and exclusion rules would be used, um, well, one example would be if you have a plant shutdown and you don't want to be getting a lot of alerts while they're changing out equipment, you could specify a specific time frame and say uh, these specific sensors uh, don't send me alerts during this time frame. Um, it's important to note that the logic between these conditions is, is an and. So if we set a specific time frame and a specific group of sensors or specific devices or specific alerts, uh, those, those conditions are all anded together to generate an exclusion rule and that would decide whether those alerts were reported or not. We can forward alerts um, to a variety of different systems. Obviously, email is one. But we can forward to a, a variety of different uh, security information events monitors, uh, including Splunk, QRadar, ArcSight, um, NetWitness, um, Sentinel, and uh, webhook. We can also go to a, a ticketing system like ServiceNow, or we can send just syslog events to other devices. Uh, these can be characterized based on priority, uh, based on the um, engines that are being used within CyberX, and there's five different engines based on protocols, uh, and we can decide to send either system or alert notifications or both. Um, to the scene. The system supports Active Directory uh, user groups, and the user groups can be associated with different privilege levels, those being read-only permission, security analyst, and uh, administrator. And each of those uh, roles can be associated with different zones, so the the access to the sensors can be controlled granularly uh, based on the zones 
Uh, all the Active Directory parameters need to be entered in here in all lower case. Uh, that's a requirement. And um, using that, the security analysts or, or administrators will be able to log in using their AD credentials. Thank you for listening to this, and um, we hope it's been useful, and we look forward to hearing from you. Bye for now.